The main focus of the uh, presentation was about uh, our adoption of uh, egg incubation technology and what it means to our industry in, in the form of developing a hatchery. Um, but I realised while I was preparing the, the presentation that uh, a lot of people here probably um, wouldn't know much about Red Claw or our industry, so I thought I'd make a quick detour and um, just introduce you to the animal. Um, so Red Claw crayfish, it's a tropical species of uh, freshwater crayfish, which a lot of people would know or recognise as something similar to a yabby. Um, Carex quadricarinatus is the, the Latin name for it. Um, it's native to the uh, Gulf drainage area of um, North Queensland and uh, the Northern Territory, um, and a little bit into Papua New Guinea as well. Um, now, red claw ticks a lot of the boxes for aquaculture in uh, a lot of the attributes that it has. Um, and you can see I've listed a few of them here that it's very fast growing, uh, particularly fast growing for crayfish as well. So uh, we can get them uh, through a grow out cycle in less than uh, 12 months. Um, has a very simple life cycle. Uh, they're very fecund, meaning they produce uh, very readily uh, young. Um, very easy to harvest compared to other crayfish species, um, which is a great thing for the farmer. For us, we can um, uh, exploit a, a behavioural characteristic that they have where they like to walk against the flow of water. So we can use a flow trap to catch them. It means we don't have to drain ponds, get in there and pick them out of the mud. Uh, it's very convenient for us. Uh, they're non-burrowing, so they don't do um, very much economic damage to earth ponds, which is where we grow them. Uh, they're fairly gregarious as far as crayfish go. Um, what that means is that um, you know, they're still not a schooling species like most of the fish that we farm or prawns. Um, but uh, because of the, the environment they live in, you know, one minute the rivers are in absolute flood and are practically fresh water from the monsoons. The next minute they're drying up into little billabongs and they're all being concentrated down into small areas. So uh, they, they tolerate each other's company very well. Um, we don't have any major disease issues with uh, red claw, although the, the introduction of white spot uh, into the prawn farms in the Logan River is very much of concern for us because uh, red claw are also susceptible to that disease. So um, we're actually very nervous about it and uh, having to rethink our biosecurity on, or on-farm biosecurity. Um, it's almost unlimited demand. Every crayfish farmer can sell absolutely everything they produce and they're getting really good prices for them. Um, so uh, and why do we call them Red Claw? Uh, Australians aren't very imaginative when it comes to naming their natural fauna. Um, we have you know, long red belly black snakes and long neck stalks and of course Red Claws. Um, but it's actually quite a sexist name because uh, it's only the male that has the red claw. Um, and it's actually quite unique in the crayfish world. You know, Australia has about 180 species of crayfish um, within Australia. And it's the only one that has this uh, red patch. And this red patch is actually soft. It's actually a chink in their armour. It actually makes them vulnerable. So uh, they must use it a lot for signalling and um, um, uh, for, you know, showing how fit they are as a male for breeding and perhaps aggression as well. We don't really know fully. So a little bit about uh, farming. Uh, this is a, a typical farm that you see here. Um, we farm in uh, earth uh, ponds. Um, basically, um, crayfish grow a lot faster in a natural environment than they do in artificial systems. No one's ever been able to get them to grow anywhere near as quick. Um, and I'll explain maybe a little bit of the reasons for that later. There's no dedicated hatchery. Um, so all juvenile production uh, um, and broodstock management is done on each farm at the moment. The largest farms have about 50 ponds, and each pond is typically about 1,000 square metres. Um, so currently uh, there's uh, about 10 farms producing about 80% of uh, Queensland's production. Um, as you can see, we produce about 100 tonnes uh, a year, which is just a drop in the ocean. Um, you know, we get phone calls, every farmer gets phone calls practically every week from people wanting tonnes and tonnes uh, each week as a trial shipment. Um, so we've got a long way to go. The prices are very good. They range from about $22 a kilo for the small animals to about $35 for a larger animal. Um, our production costs are roughly about a third, so the profit <coughs> margin is actually very high per kilo. Um, normal sizes, 50 to 120 grams is what most of the restaurants like. Um, but we can grow red claw quite large to, to well over 300 grams. Um, so for the premium red claw market, to about 150 grams upwards. By the way, that's my farm. <laughs> um, 
So just very quickly, also the history of red claw farming. So it started off almost by accident with um, people going, um, you know, camping. They'd be catching some red claw out of the local billabongs and rivers for a feed, and they'd take them back and started stocking them into their farm dams. Um, consequently, they found that they bred quite readily in these, and, uh, and that there was a bit of a demand for them. So uh, in the 80s and, and 90s, red claw was discovered as a, as a potential for aquaculture, and a lot of money was invested in it, and research began uh, at the Walkman Research Station on the Atherton Tablelands. Um, and uh, a lot of, mostly husbandry, um, was, was researched there. There was a big rapid expansion in the industry in, in, in the number of people getting into it, not necessarily in the production. Um, so there was literally hundreds of uh, aquaculture licenses for Red Claw. Uh, the rule of thumb was failure. Most people failed uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Undercapitalisation, you know, just speculators thinking they're going to get rich overnight for not having to, to work. Um, and um, you know, ill-advised and, and just ignorance. Um, so it contracted back down to about those 10 uh, farms that I told you about. And um, you know, the, the, the farmers that are doing it well are making money and, uh, and progressing. Um, after that, there was a big crash. Uh, there was quite a lot of stagnation in, in the 90s to 2006. Um, and as an association, we were always questioning, why aren't we going ahead? Why aren't we uh, producing more? Why aren't more people wanting to get into it? And there was a million reasons for it, but um, when we distilled it down, uh, we distilled it down to one salient point, and it was just production technology. Uh, the markets were great. We didn't have to do marketing. Uh, the product was accepted in, in almost every market. We just simply had to produce more animals, and we needed more farmers. Um, so uh, uh, where do we get to? So basically from 2006 uh, to present is, is really the, the the uh, main topic of this uh, presentation. Um, so, as I said, what's holding us back? It's production technology. So in 2007, we uh, applied to the RARDC for a funding grant to start a selective breeding project so we could start uh, domesticating the animal um, and uh, trying to select for, for, for quicker growth. Um, and um, consequently, we've uh, uh, had some more research projects. So selective breeding is done. We had a two-year nutrition project that's now complete. And out of that has come a, a commercial red claw pellet that uh, farmers can now use. Uh, we're doing a, a survival um, project at the moment. Uh, it's in progress. And there's a, a, a thousand different aspects to this one that I'm not going to go into because it's uh, very complex. Um, um, we're looking into BioFlock. Um, which uh, is, a, is a tool for enhancing the natural productivity of ponds. Um, if you remember, I said that um, crayfish grow a lot quicker in earth ponds than they do in artificial raceways. And the reason for that is, is that the natural productivity in a pond, all the algae, the zooplankton, phytoplankton, bacteria um, and fungi, all uh, contribute to the nutrition of the crayfish. All these things are missing in an artificial environment. So bioflock is a means of actually enhancing the, the natural productivity of ponds. Um, and uh, we're investigating that at the moment. Um, bacteriophage, or bacteriophage, if you're from North Queensland. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, growth and survival of cralings. So uh, the hatchery, now that we can produce large quantities of uh, cralings, which I'll introduce to you in a minute, um, it's opened up new areas of research because we now can have you know, tens of thousands of cralings literally in our hands, whereas before they were just being released in the ponds and we didn't know what they were doing. Uh, nutrition again, Tambocephala, it's a little ectocommensal that lives on the crayfish shells, can sometimes affect marketing if they start to lay too many eggs on the crayfish shell. Uh, viral studies that we're doing with uh, James Cook University at the moment and genome mapping. Um, so basically uh, the time was really right for us to, um, to get our hatchery technology sorted out. Crayfish is one of the only animal industries that, uh, in the agricultural world that doesn't actually have a, a hatchery. Um, so the old way was, of course, just throwing in males and females into the ponds, hoping they liked each other, see what you got at the end of 12 months. It's not a very professional way to farm. So uh, um, developing a hatchery become the focus of, uh, of our farm and our association as well. So the new way, so that's the cradling that you see there. That's as they would leave the mother. Uh, that's about the size they are. They weigh 0.02 of a grams. Um, and being able to produce large quantities of these um, 
uh, is quite advantageous to us because um, you know, we have a, a lot more control over the life cycle, disease mitigation. Uh, we can start the genetics program that I told you we did earlier uh, couldn't have been done without uh, a, a hatchery. Um, farmers now can stock an exact quantity of known age uh, cralings, which means they can better predict you know, their inputs and, of course, what they expect to get at the end of the season. Um, improve husbandry. Um, we can extend our production season by excuse me. We can extend our production season by overlapping some of the, the, the life stages. Um, we get a faster and more even growth, um, and it's opening up more areas of research that we could never have done without one before. Um, so, what does a red collar hatchery look like? Um, that's uh, one egg incubator. So basically, it's uh, one of three that we have on our farm. Um, it's based on a technique that was actually originally um, thought of in Finland. Um, in Finland they were using it as a conservation tool. They would uh, imported a disease from the US called Anthenomyces, which was devastating their native crayfish stocks. And they discovered that if they could take the eggs off the female, that they could sterilise the outside of the egg, and if they could incubate and raise that egg to, to, uh, to a release stage, that it was free of this disease. Now, um, to put it, put it into perspective, um, their crayfish um, in, in Europe or in Finland, they um, uh, spawn only once a year. It takes three years before they make their first spawn, and they produce about 50 eggs. Now, with red claw, um, they spawn in their first year, they can spawn more than once a year, um, and they can produce up to 1,000 eggs in each spawning. So uh, we've got to thinking that this might be uh, a good basis, their technology, our crayfish, if we could adapt it to, uh, to our crayfish, that it could be the basis of a hatchery. So we went to Finland, talked to the crayfish biologists there, and, and we brought a, uh, an example back um, and tried to then adapt it and change it to, um, uh, to our species. So how it basically works is it, it mimics um, what happens to the eggs when they're underneath the mother's tail. So I don't know if you know crayfish, but they have swimmerettes under their tail where the eggs connect to and they can fan them about. So what this system does is we, we take the eggs, let's see if I can find a laser pointer, yep, and they go into these baskets. So there you can see some eggs. Um, and they're put into, the, into racks, which is inside the system here, and it rocks them backwards and forwards, and the basket's designed such that the eggs can tumble inside it and uh, get oxygen and, uh, and uh, stay clean. Um, they basically go through uh, a few stages, uh, which I think the next slide yep, is uh, uh, better to demonstrate. So um, here you see, uh, find that, keep losing that button. Uh, uh, a crayfish egg. It's what we call an eyed egg. It's, this guy is ready to, to hatch. Um, you probably can't see the detail on this big picture, but in here all these appendages and tail uh, are all very tightly packed in there. Um, after they hatch, they become a stage one larvae. Um, and you can see here there's the eggshell that he's still holding onto, and they quite often hang onto that for a long time. Uh, we're still not sure if they eat it or not. Um, after 10 days, they molt, so they come out of their shell. Um, and uh, into a stage two larvae. You can actually see his old shell there, which he's uh, hanging on to. Uh, and you can actually still see the eggshell is still uh, there as well after 16 days now. OK. Um, one of the problems that, uh, you know, there was many problems that we had to overcome. And the last real showstopper for us was uh, a bacterial infection that we used to get uh, called for, from a bacteria called Aeromonas hydrophila. Controlling this guy was a nightmare for us. Uh, it was completely random, uh, and uh, it's quite a ubiquitous bacteria. It lives just about everywhere. It, it's uh, in all our river systems, in every puddle, uh, quite often in our drinking water as well. Um, but it just happened to love this system, and when it got into this system, um, it would proliferate and kill all our stage two larvae. It was very frustrating. And uh, in the process, we discovered uh, a technique called bacteriophage. And, and what it is, as you can see here, they actually look like uh, viruses. Um, they're actually a parasite that uh, parasite off bacteria. And um, so they only uh, can parasite uh, prokaryotic cells, not eukaryotic cells, like multicellular organisms like us. And you can see they, they basically, that's a Aeromonas hydrophila bacteria here. And they literally land on it, inject their DNA into it, and start hijacking the machinery to, to manufacture more copies of itself. So here you can see, here's a Aeromonas hydrophila. This is all taken uh, from pictures from, uh, um, that was isolated from our system. Um, I just wanted to point out first that they're actually always in the system and they're always on the bacteria. The technique basically works by um, 
uh, extracting the particular bacteriophage, and it only attacks one particular to, uh, species of bacteria. So it leaves all the rest of your the bacteria, um, you know, the useful bacteria uh, in, uh, uh, in situ. It doesn't affect them. Um, so all we do is we isolate the one that we need and uh, amplify it, and then re-inoculate the system within, within about 15 minutes. Um, you literally get this effect where here's a bacteria that's just ruptured and here's all the bacteriophage spilling out of it and starting to reinfect the next one. Um, if people um, uh, uh, have bacterial problems in the particular industries that you come from, I really recommend that you Google it. When we first heard about it, we thought this is just too good to be true and being the natural born skeptic that I am, uh, didn't believe it until um, you know, we tried the technique and for the first time we were able to turn around a bacterial infection in a hatchery, which we'd never been able to do before. Um, we've done this quite a few times now. It's not perfect, <coughs> excuse me, it's not perfect yet, um, but uh, a very promising technology. Um, so where we're at now is that um, uh, the demand for cralings, uh, we've now done enough trials that, uh, and proven the success of them that uh, uh, the demand for them is just skyrocketing. So we're now working in conjunction with uh, a company called the Australian Crayfish Hatchery, which has just started. They've just started production in Townsville. Um, we're working in collaboration with them, and uh, our farm is supplying the eggs to them to, uh, to incubate. Uh, it become too much work for us to do. I just wanted to be a farmer um, and spent too much time in the lab, and I'd rather be out in the sun getting wet and muddy and, and farming. So uh, we've, uh, we're cooperating with the Australian Crayfish Hatchery, and. Um, uh, and we're hoping to be able to start producing uh, you know, tens of millions uh, in the short term and potentially hundreds of millions because the demand for it uh, overseas is actually uh, what's surprising us. Uh, probably nine out of ten inquiries we get for them is from overseas. <clears throat> um, so quickly in conclusion, um, as I was already preempted, preemptively said there, that uh, the, uh, we went to China a couple of times last year and we've had quite a few uh, visit, Chinese visits to our farm. And they're looking for, um, uh, they love their crayfish. They produce uh, something like 180,000 tonnes of the American swamp red crawfish. Uh, and they're looking to red claw because they grow a lot bigger. So it's a, a much more premium product. For them. Um, it's actually uh, quite an exciting time for us because there's so much interest now uh, uh, on the back of a, a lot of the um, successes we've had um, uh, with uh, filling the knowledge gaps in our industry. Um, so uh, what we really need to thank is RARDC, RODIC. Um, they've funded three projects from ours, and as I was just pointing out today before the conference, um, <clears throat> it wasn't just the money that they gave to, our, to allow our projects to run. Uh, the, the, the main benefit for us has been uh, that it's really legitimised our industry and uh, given us a reputation now that um, universities are approaching us, saying, oh, we've got a PhD student who wants to study this, or we can, we can even approach them freely now. And uh, so we're getting all these little spin-off projects, and, uh, and the networking into the academic world has just been a real boon for our industry. And uh, this is why it's exciting, because uh, the researchers are also genuinely interested to, to work with the animal um, and, and progress it. Um, the James Cook University, uh, who's done a lot of work for us and continues to, um, the Queensland Crayfish Farmers Association uh, uh, and CSIRO is beginning to get involved as well and especially the farmers. The farmers have been really hard working and there's an example of one hard at work there. Um, they've been donating a lot of their farm resources to run a lot of the projects that uh, I've mentioned um, and uh, they're now paying a research levy so with these small amounts of money that we're, we're, we're gathering we're able to start attracting more funding from within research institutions to do more and more research. So to, to, to sum it up, you know, I'm very excited about our industry. I think we're finally starting, we're sort of over the hump now and uh, I think we're really, uh, we'll start to progress the industry. And uh, we need more farmers, so if anybody needs to farm, you know, there's no competition, we just need more product. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>